Okay, so continuing on looking at one-to-one -one transformations of the plane, building towards a general formula for change of variables and multiple integrals, we want to look at the following. So let's let t of u v be x u v y u v. So this is like from the plane to the plane, and x and y are like nice functions in terms of u and v. So the picture can look like this. Here we have the u v plane. Over here we have the x y plane, and then our our uh, transformation t goes between them. Okay, so we've got this square, or really I should think of this as a rectangle in the UV plane. So I've based it in the bottom left at this point, U naught, V naught. I've given it a uh, length in the horizontal direction of delta U and a uh, length in the vertical direction of delta V. So I've got this delta U by delta V rectangle. And so I've written that as my delta A. In other words, my very, very small area component is given by delta U times delta V. So that's pretty obvious because we've got a rectangle over here. But now what we want to see is what happens if we push this into the X y plane and we no longer have a rectangle. So let's see what we've got going on over here. So this bottom edge right here will go to this curve right here. And so how am I defining this function r? So this function r of uh, u v naught will be given by uh, this curve x u v naught y uh, u v naught. So now that we have fixed v naught, this is just a curve in the x y plane that is parametrized by u. So that's how we can think about that. Um, that's not too bad. Okay, good. So just to reiterate, this bottom edge is going to go to this curve right here. Okay. And now, what about uh, this? Uh, leftmost edge. So this leftmost edge is what you get when you set uh, v equal to the variable and u naught as the constant. So in other words, uh, we have r of u naught v. So that's going to be x of u naught uh, v and then y of u naught v. So that's going to be this curve on the left edge. And then you can think about what the top edge curve and the right edge curve is as well. And so our goal is to find the area of that region R, which is bound by those four orange curves. And finding that area exactly is quite difficult. So what we do is we approximate it by a parallelogram. So what I've done here is I've taken a line that is tangent to this bottom curve. So notice this bottom curve is given by R of U V naught. And so that means uh, a line that is tangent to it will have tangent vector R sub U. In other words, we're taking the derivative of this with respect to the variable U. Okay, and then you might say, well, what length do I need for this? Well, I need a length that is compatible with this guy over here, so that length will be delta U. Okay, good. And now, well, I'm going to approximate this leftmost curve by, again, taking a tangent vector to it. And so that will be r sub v, in other words, the partial derivative of r with respect to v. And what length should I give it? Well, I'm going to give it the length delta v. Okay, now we're all set. So notice that this blue parallelogram misses a lot of the stuff that uh, this orange bounded uh, region misses, but it also overcounts stuff. But what we want to think about is the limit as delta u and delta v go to zero. And as uh, delta u and delta v go to zero, notice that this is going to give a better and a better and a better approximation because that's eventually what we're going to do with uh, some sort of integral. Okay, so now we can talk about this uh, delta A bar component, which is the area of that uh, right-hand side. And so this is going to be approximately equal to the area of the blue parallelogram. Not exactly equal to the area of the blue parallelogram, but kind of good enough for the purposes of taking a limit later.
But we have a formula from earlier in the course for the area of such a parallelogram in terms of a cross product. So notice that is going to be equal to the magnitude of the vector r u uh, delta u uh, cross r v delta v. And so the great thing is, is we can take that delta u and the delta v out, and this is going to be equal to the magnitude of r u cross r v times delta u delta v. Okay, good. So that's going to be the area of that blue parallelogram. Okay, so I'm going to erase this bottom part, bring it up just a little bit, and then we will write that in terms of these functions x and y. Okay, so we ended at this point where we have this uh, delta A bar is approximately equal to this cross product of R U cross R V times uh, delta U delta V. So notice uh, that's going to be equal to, so we need uh, the cross product, so we'll do that with a matrix. So I, J, K, and the top component. And then um, R U, so that is going to be X U, Y U, uh, and then here we have x, v, y, v. So that'll be uh, the derivative of the component functions, x and y. And then you might say, well, go what goes on with the third component? Well, those third components are going to be zero because we only have two variables. So we get something like that. Okay, good. But now taking the cross product here, see that we only need to worry about this uh, last row and the top column. Oh, and I noticed I forgot a delta u delta v here because that last row is all zeros except for the top component. So that's going to give us the magnitude of the vector. So notice we have x u uh, times y v minus um, x v times y u and that's going to be in the k direction and then times delta u delta v. But now since the magnitude of the k vector, it's a unit vector, so that magnitude is 1. So here we get uh, exactly equal to x u uh, y v minus x v y u times delta u delta v. Okay, great. And now this thing is important enough to give it its own definition, and the definition of that is uh, the Jacobian, and we can write that in terms of a matrix. And so uh, we'll do that over here. So let's define the Jacobian of this transformation as follows. And so uh, we'll write it in the following way. So it'll be dxy duv. So that is the determinant of the matrix, which is given by dx du dx dv dy du and then dy dv. So I've mixed. I've went, gone back to this notation for partial derivatives because it's more standard in this case. So that is the Jacobian for a two-variable transformation. And so that is going to be extremely useful in this case because notice that we can write this as uh, the Jacobian times this delta u delta v, which is going to set up our change of variables really nicely in the future. Okay, and so now I can also similarly define a Jacobian for a three variable transformation in the following way. So I'll write it as partial x, y, z, partial u, v, w. So you can do it exactly as you would guess. So we have dx du, partial x, partial v, partial x, partial w in the first row, partial y, partial u, partial y, uh, partial uh, v, partial y, partial w in the second row, partial z, partial u, partial z, partial v, partial z, partial w in the third row.
So we won't derive this geometrically, but you can kind of guess what's going on. We go from a rectangular box on this side to a parallel pipette on this side, and we use the formula for the volume of a parallel pipette to get at this. Okay, so here we've got the Jacobian in two variables, the Jacobian in three variables. So I'll clean up this side of the board and we'll look at some examples. Okay, so now that we've motivated the definition of the Jacobian, we're gonna look at some examples. So the first example we'll look at is the change to polar coordinates. And so here we have uh, dxy dr theta, because r and theta are variables. So notice that's going to be the determinant. Now we have dx dr up in this upper left component. So partial x with respect to r is going to be cosine theta up there. And then we'll have uh, dx d theta here, so that's going to give us minus r sine theta, so that's going to be dx d theta, and then we're going to do the same thing for y. So down here we'll have sine theta, and here we'll have r cosine theta for the same reasons. Now we'll take the determinant of this, so notice that's going to be equal to r cosine squared theta, so that's multiplying cosine theta and r cosine theta. And then we're going to have minus a negative r sine squared theta. So that's going to be plus r sine squared theta. So notice that's going to give us r times cos squared theta plus sine squared theta. We can factor that out, but that's equal to exactly r. And now notice the change of variables formula for integrals that involved a change to polar coordinates gave us an, an extra r as a part of the integral. And that's where this comes from in general. Okay, great. I'll erase the board. We'll do one more two-variable example and then one three-variable example. Okay, so for our next example, we'll look at the following transformation. So we have x equals u cubed and y equals v over u squared. So I'm just gonna go ahead and rewrite this as v times u to the minus two, because that might be easier to see for partial derivatives. So now our uh, Jacobian, so our dxy by duv, so that's going to be the determinant of the two by two matrix whose upper left entry will be the partial of x with respect to u. So notice that's going to give us three u squared. Now we need the partial of x with respect to v. So that's going to be zero because there's no v there. Now the partial of y with respect to u. So notice that's going to be minus two um, u to the minus three times v, okay? And then the partial of y with respect to v, so that's going to be a u to the minus 2. Okay, great. So now we take the uh, determinant. So this times this is going to give us 0, so we just have 3u times u to the minus 2, so that's just going to give us 3. Okay, great. So I'm going to clean up the board, then we're going to do a three-variable example. Okay, our final example will be this three-variable uh, transformation. So we have x is u times e uh, to the v plus w, y is u times e to the v minus w, and z is w squared. So I'm going to go ahead and notice I can write this as u times e to the v times e to the w. This is u times e to the v times e to the minus w, and then again that's just w squared. Okay, so I have my uh, dxyz by duvw, so my Jacobian, it's going to be the determinant of a 3x3 three three matrix. So the top row will be all the derivatives of x, so notice with respect to u, we're going to get e to the v times w, so that's e to the v times e to the w. Okay, and now with respect to V, so notice with respect to V, nothing's going to change. I get U, E to the V, E to the W, and then with respect to W, I'll get the same thing again. U, E to the V, um, E to the W. Okay, so I get something like that. Okay, so now notice uh, for y, uh, it's going to be fairly similar. I'm going to have e to the v, e to the minus w for my first entry because the derivative with respect to u. 
And then for my second entry, I'll have u e to the v e to the minus w. And then for my third entry, I'll have um, minus u e to the v e to the minus w because by the chain rule and the derivative with respect to w, I need that. Now the partial with respect to z is pretty easy. I've got uh, 0, 0, and then minus 2, w in that entry right there. Okay, great. Now I'm going to take the determinant of this, and now notice because I have a row with almost all zeros, I have a really nice uh, expansion that I can do. So I can expand about this row, and then this column, and that's all I'll get. So notice I'll take a uh, plus for this entry, minus, plus, minus, plus, so there's a plus uh, connected to that expansion. So review determinants in linear algebra if you need to right here. But so that's going to give us minus 2 times w times the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix. So e to the v plus w, I'm just going to multiply those together. Uh, u e to the v plus w, um, e to the v minus w, and then u e to the v minus w. So we've got something like that. Now we're ready to go, so this is going to be minus 2 times w. Now this times this uh, is going to give us u, and then we're going to have e to the 2v, because we have v plus w uh, times v minus w, and then we'll subtract u to the, so let's see what we get here, uh, to the e to the 2v, just as before, but now notice that's all going to cancel out to zero, which actually means that we started with something that is not a one-to-one -one transformation, but this still serves as a nice example for calculating the Jacobian of uh, one of these types of functions. Okay, great, so this is the end of the video.